Okay, everyone. Well, why don't we get started? Thank you so much for joining us. Um, today, we are so uh, grateful to have um, Dr. Laura Siffer Bean and Dr. Kishore Velodi um, here to talk with us. And we have another very special guest, um, Carrie Linden, who will introduce. Um, they'll be talking about hot off the presses, new healthcare guidelines for children and adults with Down syndrome. Um, so I'll introduce Carrie Linden. She's a self-advocate with Down syndrome and an office assistant for the Down Syndrome Association of Northeast Ohio. And Carrie, you can go ahead and introduce our speakers. Hi, I am Carrie Linden. I am 44 years old and I have Down syndrome. I'm here to introduce today's presenters. Laura, Laura, Laura Sifa Bean, MD, is a general pediatrician with over 25 years of experiences in helping families. She has a special interest in people with developmental disabilities, especially Down syndrome. She earned her undergraduate and medical degrees from Hayes Western Reserve University and did her pediatric training at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. In 2022, she joined the Down Syndrome Association of Northeast Ohio, formerly known as the Upside of Downs, as their medical outreach director. She has presented workshops on Down Syndrome at national and regional conferences. She is a past board member of the National Down Syndrome Congress and current member of the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group USA. She has three children, including an adult son with Down Syndrome. Dr. Kishore Velodi completed his medical degree at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Med Medicine and, is, and, has, and his pediatric residency at the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. He is a professor at pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and has been on the faculty since 2005. In March 2009, he became medical director of the Down Syndrome Center of Western Pennsylvania. Dr. Velody also served as president of the National Down Syndrome Congress from 2016 to 2019. Dr. Velody has spoken at a variety of local, local, regional, national, and international meetings on the care of children, Down syndrome. Mr. Dr. Velody became a pediatrician in large part because of his relationship with his older brother, Das, who is smart, funny, caring, and also has Down syndrome. Please welcome Dr. Sifra Bean. Thank you, Carrie. You did a great job. Thank you so much. Carrie is one of the first people I ever met with Down syndrome when my son was a baby. We've known each other for a long time. I'm going to share my screen now. So in the early 1980s, a group of parents whose children had Down syndrome started to meet for coffee to socialize and support each other. 40 years later, with the help of many supporters, their vision and hard work has taken the Down Syndrome Association of Northeast Ohio from a grassroots parent movement to a staff nonprofit organization joining over a thousand families in 16 counties throughout Northeast Ohio. The Sanio envisions a community where people with Down syndrome have limitless opportunities and the ability to pursue their dreams. Our mission is to provide support, education, and advocacy for people with Down syndrome, their families, and their communities. Oh. <laughs> I had my first experience with Sanio um, before my son Christopher, the cute baby in the picture, was born. I was a fourth year medical student at Case Western Reserve University and had an abnormal ultrasound and was advised to have an amniocentesis. The amnio showed trisomy 21. I was referred to a local support group, the Upside of Downs, which is now Down Syndrome Association of Northeast Ohio. They provided with a lot of support before and after the pregnancy and really have guided our whole concept of inclusion, which has guided us throughout Christopher's life. I also had a lot of support from a neonatologist, 
um, Dr. Bob Kliegman, who at that time was the residency director at Rainbow Babies and Children. And that's how I ended up being a pediatrician. And um, that led to a 25 year career in primary care where one of my joys was taking care of people with Down syndrome and disabilities. Um, I began my new position um, in January with Desanio because of some health issues with Christopher that you'll hear about more later. When I was in practice um, with Desanio and in practice in primary care, one of our big problems was finding adult providers to help care for people with um, disabilities as they transition from pediatric to adult care. In the past, many people with Down syndrome died in childhood, but with the advent of surgical interventions to correct congenital heart disease, community inclusion, and better care in general, the average lifespan of people with Down syndrome is now around 60. And this has led to a much larger population of adults with Down syndrome that need care. Unfortunately, the access to health care has not increased accordingly. Dr. Lisa Iazzoni, a disability researcher, did a survey of 714 practicing physicians in the United States. And her results showed that only 40.7% of physicians were very confident about their ability to provide equal quality care to patients with a disability. Just 56.5% strongly agreed that they welcomed disabled patients into their practices. And 18.1% strongly agreed that the healthcare system often treats these patients unfairly. Despite these findings, I know that high quality care for adults with Down syndrome is possible because of my experiences with my son in 2021. At the end of November, 2020, I had become ill. My COVID was negative, but I stayed away from Christopher anyway and isolated. I had been staying away from Christopher because we had started to see sick patients in the office and all the reports about the increased risk of um, severe COVID in people with Down syndrome were in the news at that time. When I came out of isolation, I noticed Chris acting funny. He said he was dizzy and his eyes were gray and black. I thought he was orthostatic, so I increased his fluids. Twice he said his alarm clock looked funny in the middle of the night if his eyes were watering. Um, he said he saw 618 like in the numerator and denominator for a second. He had a televisit with his internist, Dr. Detour, and we had a plan if things progressed. Two days later, he was looking straight at me and looked startled. And I asked him what was wrong. And he saw, he saw a reflection of me for a couple seconds. Um, I made an appointment with his eye doctor, Dr. Riffle, who had seen Chris since childhood and had seen him the year before and had a normal exam. And he said Christopher had papilledema. Dr. Riffle called Dr. Detour and Dr. Detour ordered an MRI which showed hydrocephalus. Um, Dr. Detour called Dr. Crystal Tomei, a pediatric neurosurgeon at Rainbow because Chris had seen her a couple years before when, um, when he had some neck pain. Now Chris was 28, so Dr. Detour sent us, Dr. Tomei sent us to the ER and contacted the adult neurosurgery team since Chris was 28 now. So a few days later, Chris got a VP shunt. This is Chris getting ready to go to the OR because it was in the middle of the COVID surge. Um, and he did well. There was a hygroma post-op that we had to follow up on. And in March, a follow-up MRI when Chris had no symptoms showed a subdural hematoma that needed to be drained. So admitted to the hospital again and another surgery. This is Chris post-op with his um, bandage and his drain that went into the, the brain to keep draining the fluids. That was probably the hardest thing because Chris wanted to pull out the drain because he didn't like it. And it was hard to explain to him to leave it alone. So the nurses were so lovely. I was there all the time and they let Andy stay overnight even though it was COVID surge to um, help make sure that drain didn't get pulled out. So Chris went home and he had close follow-up from his neurosurgeons his neuro ophthalmologist, and of course, we kept Dr. Detour in the loop about everything. Chris healed slowly, but well. Um, in February, he had a seizure, and so we added a neurologist to the team, but that didn't recur. So 
he's continued to progress. And this is Chris this summer when he was at the um, regional meet of Special Olympics Unified Golf with my husband where he um, won a bronze medal. So he's doing really well. Let me share how Chris feels about this whole situation in the short video that is next. Hi guys, uh, this is Chris here. Uh, during the past year, I had two brain surgeries. Uh, the first one was in January of last year. I had a, a ventriculoperitoneal shunt, and that went really well. I was doing everything fine. Uh, the second surgery was in March of last year, and I had a titanium plate in my head, and I also had a subdural hematoma, but with a drain, and I couldn't walk for about four days, so I stay in the hospital, but right now I'm fine and I'm free and I love it. Well, the names of my doctors were uh, Dr. Tomei, Dr. Jeffrey Nelson, uh, Dr. Michael Morgan, uh, the, the neurosurgeons, uh, all of them are just fantastic doctors. Uh, I had a couple of favorite nurses also. One looked like Marcia Brady from the Brady Bunch, and she really liked that company a whole lot. Um, I really appreciate Dr. Nelson and what he did for me in, in the OR. He was with me the entire time. Chris remembers going back to the OR very vividly. It was the only time during his hospitalizations that I wasn't allowed to be with him. And Dr. Nelson walked with him from the pre-op area back to the OR and stayed with him. So Chris would feel better when I wasn't there. Um, Dr. Nelson has since left university hospitals and Chris was very sad about that. None of these adult doctors had special training in Down syndrome, but they were all kind, respectful and did their best to take care of Christopher. And that's what I want for all people with Down syndrome. In preparing for this talk, I did, talked to a couple of Chris's doctors. His internist, Dr. Detour, said that taking care of Chris was not that different from taking care of the older, medically complex patients he sees all the time. He uses checklists for different types of patients and says the checklist is different, but the skill set and the knowledge you apply is still the same. Dr. Tomei felt the biggest thing she provided was a warm handoff and perspective to the neurosurgeons. She said there's a distinct advantage when the handoffs are coordinated by physicians while ensuring that the parents and patients have all the information they need to be their best advocate. So my plea today is that all of you will welcome people with Down syndrome and disabilities into your practices. I know there's a lot of pressure on physicians today and the thought of taking on patients who are complicated and need extra time could be daunting. Desanio wants to help physicians and healthcare providers through our community of care. The goal of our program is to increase the knowledge of families, students, and professionals so that individuals with Down syndrome can receive the best care possible. To achieve this, we wanna have a great website, we have publications, we wanna provide webinars and educational presentations. And we will also be starting an email newsletter that summarizes the important clinical and research findings. We're so fortunate to have a local group of experts to help guide us in our mission. These include Dr. Alberto Costa, a nationally and world recognized researcher in Down syndrome and cognition who has an adult daughter with Down syndrome. Irene Dietz, who runs the Comp Care Clinic at um, Metro Health. Catherine Koenig, who's a researcher at the Cleveland Clinic who has a sister with Down syndrome. Nancy Roizen, a nationally noted expert on Down syndrome, who is a developmental pediatrician at Rainbow Bays and Children. Dr. Saida Mantel, who's a psychiatrist at UH. Carl Tyler, a family practice doctor who takes care of many people with disabilities and is currently the president of the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. And Mary Wong, a pediatrician who runs the Down syndrome clinic at the Cleveland Clinic. We are also fortunate to have 
access to national organizations and experts who will help families and providers find the information and resources they need. We are very pleased to partner with the Global Down Syndrome Foundation. Global is a lead advocacy organization for Down Syndrome in the United States and partners with Congress and the NIH. They provide clinical care at their C Center in Denver, Colorado, and have donated $32 million to found a Down Syndrome Research Institute that supports 400 scientists. If you have any time, please check out some of their resources and website because the work they do is amazing. They spearheaded the adult guidelines that you'll hear about next, and they did send um, copies of the global family-friendly guidelines. I'm in COVID isolation right now, so Alyssa has those and those will be available soon for you. I think as you get to know people with Down syndrome, you will find them very loving and kind and very gratifying to take care of. So I thank you for your time today, and I'm very happy to hand over the presentation to Dr. Velody. Oh, I missed I missed one slide, but to sign up for our newsletter, please drop your email in the chat or at the end of the presentation, I'll put the slide up for there's a QR code. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, Kishore. No, that's totally fine. Um, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Kishore Velody and uh, greetings from Pittsburgh, just down just down the road from you all. I was uh, Looking forward to coming to do this in person, but then, of course, as we've been saying for two years, COVID. Uh, thankfully, not for me, but it did impact our abilities to travel today. But I want to share with you uh, two talks in one and do it in 20 minutes, which means that I'm going to try to fit four hours of information probably into this 20 minutes. So we will have ample time for Q&A afterwards. This might feel like a bit of a whirlwind uh, for you, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, updated, recently updated healthcare guidelines in uh, taking care of people with Down syndrome who are kids, adolescents, adults, and then uh, that time for open Q&A. So this is the pediatric uh, guideline where you can find on pediatrics.org. It was just released actually just a few months ago in April as an update and uh, really great information there. What I want to do is I'm just going to very, very briefly just take you through some of the, the highlights of the uh, paper, and then uh, you guys can can read this on your own. Obviously, I'm not going to go through this entire table together with you, but one of the greatest impacts I find in this uh, guideline was that they finally, in my opinion, uh, finally were able to address the most important thing is how do you discuss the diagnosis of Down syndrome with a family? And uh, using evidence-based guidelines, uh, they, they came up with uh, this information, which is found in a table in there. It's so important as and Dr. Sifra Bean was just sharing, uh, the, the memory of how you were told uh, is something that stays with families forever. And so it's important as uh, I know many of you are medpeds uh, or maybe even peds in the audience, you're gonna have this opportunity many times to share unexpected news. This is actually really helpful, um, this table to, to, to figure out how to do that. Um, and uh, so let me just go through the pediatric guidelines very quickly here. They're, they're summarized in the article in a table format like this, which some of the families may actually print out on their own so that they have it. So you should be familiar with this as well. Uh, there are several action statements that are there, um, which uh, very, very briefly I'll be able to hit on. Most importantly, when they're first born, and the most important thing we can do after we share the diagnosis, of course, is to confirm the diagnosis with a karyotype. That can be done prenatally with a chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis or after the baby is born, if this is a postnatal diagnosis. Um, but as we've moved forward now into the modern era of genetic testing, uh, things such as non-invasive prenatal screening or NIPS or NIPT, or you may be hearing it as well. Uh, those are blood tests that you can do on mom that have a fairly high accuracy, especially uh, when uh, moms are getting a little bit uh, beyond the age of 35. And so uh, they're helpful, but they're, you have to get a karyotype in order to know which type of Down syndrome the child has. And so uh, no matter how it was uh, discovered prenatally, some sort of karyotype needs to be done. Referral to a geneticist, genetic counselor, Down syndrome clinic, if that's available in your area, also is very important. Um, the uh, offering parent support information to the family, uh, and then using Down syndrome specific growth charts, which were updated back in 2015 um, to be more accurate in looking at uh, the uh, growth charts. So you can find these online on the CDC website. You can also go to one of my favorite websites for all things pediatrics is called PD Tools, P E T. 
P-E-D-I, T-O-O-L-S. Um, and they uh, on there will let you put in the date of birth, the date of service, and the um, you can put in your growth parameters. It'll tell you where they fall on the Down syndrome specific growth curve. Uh, which is very helpful. All babies with Down syndrome when they're born need to have an echocardiogram done. Even a fetal echo is not enough. It has to be done after they're born and it should be read by a pediatric cardiologist. That's very important. Uh, new to this update of the guideline was talking about doing a feeding assessment. So if babies uh, seem to have significant hypotonia or they're having a hard time feeding in the newborn nursery, it's a really great idea to get that feeding assessment done, but really keeping that in mind for the entire life of the child and adolescent, if they ever develop coughing, choking, gagging with feeds, it's important to consider swallow dysfunction and get a feeding assessment done. Pretty much, I think all 50 states in the US have a universal uh, newborn hearing screening program. So number seven, where it talks about getting the hearing screening, I think in the US, that's pretty much uh, standard. If for some reason, they don't pass that newborn hearing screening, then it's very important within the first two or three months that they get a repeat hearing screening done because hearing loss is so much more common in people with Down syndrome. Uh, if you cannot see the tympanic membrane, which is unfortunately not uncommon in our babies, especially because they have narrow external auditory canals, uh, the guidelines recommend referral to an ENT for a direct visualization of the TMs uh, using their uh, equipment. Um, a car seat safety test in the newborn nursery is recommended to make sure they're safe in that position before they leave the hospital. Uh, getting a complete blood count in the first three days of life is incredibly important because of something called transient abnormal myelopoiesis or TAM. Uh, unlike Chris in the video, some of us struggle with saying all these medical terms, <laughs> but Chris did so well. So we usually call it TAF. But this is a, um, a form of leukemia that the child can actually be born with. And um, uh, it's, it's important for oncologists to be involved in management of that um, as the uh, child gets older. So that's why we want to make sure that they get a blood count when they're first born. Most, uh, I should say most, all uh, newborn screenings in the country involve some form of thyroid screening, but not all of that includes a TSH. I couldn't find on the Ohio State website what you guys have in Ohio, but in Pennsylvania, unfortunately, they just run a T4 or thyroxine level. But we know that in people with Down syndrome, particularly, they can have a normal T4 when they're born, but their TSH can be markedly elevated. And so they are likely well on their way towards true hyper hypothyroidism, but you may not know if your state newborn screen only does a T4. So it's really important that they get a TSH done. And then that gets repeated every six months, mm -hmm. really for the rest of their life. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, for the rest of their first year of life. And then after that, it's annually from uh, age of one through adulthood. Uh, the RSV prophylaxis is similar to what it is for uh, everybody else, uh, depending on whether they qualify uh, for cardiac or respiratory or prematurity reasons. Um, the synergist shot is what you may know that uh, well as. We talk a lot about atlantoaxial instability. This is number 14 on this list. Um, that's where uh, the kids will have, or adults, will have increased laxity of C1 on C2 vertebrae. And so it's important to do at all health maintenance visits, that's what HMV stands for, at all health maintenance visits, that a complete history and physical exam be done to look for neurologic signs of upper motor neuron deficits that can be indicative of atlantoaxial instability. If we discover that, then we move forward with x-ray and pot potentially MRI uh, after that. And number 15 is talking about not uh, encouraging complementary alternative medicine use, which is something that we do see in the disability community, probably at a higher rate, including Down syndrome. And so important to talk about those things with families, as we know that some of those supplements can have uh, detrimental effects. And we uh, want to make sure that the kids are all referred to early intervention or birth to three, you may know it as services. Um, that's really important uh, to help with their development. Um, hearing evaluations, we were talking about uh, earlier, we, we do that at the newborn period, but also at six months uh, of age, and then annually starting at 12 months of age, um, which is uh, really important. Actually, I should, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Six, every six months until they're about three or four, that's when their speech development is so important to have hearing involved after four, then we go to annual uh, screening uh, for hearing. Um, referring them to an ophthalmologist at, at around six months of age is very important for vision exams. We um, 
uh, you can imagine number 20 talking about checking a blood count if they're having any signs of leukemia seems somewhat um, self-evident, but that's important. Uh, a, a big one here too that we're looking at with uh, number 21 is looking at sleep disordered breathing. We know sleep apnea is very common in people with Down syndrome. And so uh, we, uh, I think, it might be on the next uh, slide, but we refer everybody with Down syndrome between the age of three and four for a sleep study. Uh, and that's uh, in everyone with Down syndrome, regardless of symptoms, because we know sleep apnea is so common and is so commonly uh, asymptomatic. And so it's important to know if they have that. Um, and uh, annually, starting at a year, we do do screenings for anemia, and you can see details of that there in number 23 and 24. Um, vision screenings, um, the uh, AAP, when they do their uh, uh, recommendations, uh, make their guidelines, the, they involve all the different academies within the uh, uh, all the different um, uh, subspecialties. So the ophthalmologist talked about something called a photo screen, which we were not very familiar with, as most of us are general pediatricians or, or geneticists uh, in the audience when we were really hurt hearing about this, but apparently this is something that ophthalmologists can do uh, regularly uh, in their office. But anyway, a vision screening should be done regularly uh, for um, uh, children uh, with Down syndrome, which you can see here. Looking at uh, going further on down, talking about things like transitioning from early intervention to the preschool developmental screenings uh, is, is very important. Looking at sexual exploitation. This is a very sad uh, commentary, but truly we do see more uh, issues with um, uh, predators, sexual predators, uh, especially uh, for people with Down syndrome, which is sad, but uh, uh, important for people with Down syndrome and their families to be educated on um, how to uh, protect themselves from those types of situations. Um, talking about um, uh, menarche and preparing young ladies for their uh, cycles and STI prevention is important to talk about, as it would be with any other teenager, but it's uh, sometimes forgotten when we think about talking about that with someone with a disability, but it is important to discuss talking about pregnancies, uh, potential pregnancies and risks perhaps to that specific person if they were to become pregnant. Um, assessing for regression. Regression is a relatively new thing that we're seeing. Oh, not It's newly discussed, I should say, um, seen in teenagers and early uh, young adults with Down syndrome. This is a, a very scary phenomenon, which I can talk about more later uh, if anyone is interested, but we're just now recognizing this as a separate entity and one that actually is quite treatable if we recognize it early. It used to be something that people would call early onset dementia, which is actually doesn't exist uh, in terms of an 18-year-old with Down syndrome having dementia. So it's something we need to be thinking about, and I can certainly discuss that further in our Q&A time. Um, and then lastly, for the pediatric guidelines, before we get to the adult guidelines, is talking about when they become adults, what are the next steps? After high school is completed, there are over 300 um, uh, undergraduate programs that are available and specifically tailored for people with disabilities, including Down syndrome. There's also obviously options for work. And then they have to think about guardianship or uh, power of attorney and um, um, adult medical care, independent living. All of these things are very, very important and something that uh, should be discussed with young uh, people with Down syndrome as they get closer to those uh, adult years. Now, speaking of adult years, I think many in the audience are practicing in internal medicine or will be uh, soon. Uh, and so I want to make sure that you are aware of uh, the adult healthcare guidelines. The first ever adult healthcare guidelines came out in 2020, and you can uh, find it here uh, using this reference. So I'm going to do something very similar to what we just did with the pediatric guidelines, and then we'll have time for Q&A after that. So the adult healthcare guidelines, we thought we had it hard with pediatrics and that we always complain about how we don't have much specific data to make guidelines from uh, in pediatrics. Well, in adults, it's even less. Uh, Down syndrome specific research for adults with Down syndrome is very, very um, um, non-existent almost. And so you can see here the strength of recommendation. It'll be a um, a ongoing uh, thing that you'll see throughout this um, this portion of the talk where it'll either be very low or low for almost all of them because of the lack of data. So they looked at several categories. Behavioral was the first category that they uh, put recommendations forward. So thinking about mental health in adults with Down syndrome. See, there's this misconception that many people uh, will have uh, that will say everybody with Down syndrome is always happy. And that is so wrong. People with Down syndrome have all the gamut of emotions. And it's important for 
medical professionals to be aware of the fact that when mental health issues, depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, these are all things that we see in people with Down syndrome. It's important to make the diagnosis correctly. It's important to have a referral uh, um, uh, location where somebody who is knowledgeable about managing these conditions, if it's not you, uh, you would have somebody who you could refer to uh, for adults with Down syndrome. The next section they looked at was dementia. We know that Alzheimer type dementia is more common in people with Down syndrome, um, but it is um, extremely unlikely to almost never, you could say, somebody under 40 with Down syndrome having dementia. And that's when we want to think about that um, regression condition that I was talking with you about earlier. Um, but we should recognize Alzheimer type dementia and be screening for it starting at age 40. And age 40, they said, because Again, a very low percent of people will have dementia at that age with Down syndrome, and so they can establish a baseline. And following the six domains of looking for Alzheimer type dementia that, as my understanding, I'm not an internist, but this is something that you would do with older adults to screen them for uh, Alzheimer anyway, these conditions, or these domains you would be looking at. Similarly, you would look at these domains in somebody with Down syndrome, but you begin at age 40, which may be younger, obviously, than you would normally do for uh, your other adults that you take care of in your clinic. Okay, next section they looked at was in diabetes. Um, uh, the diabetes screening is recommended to be started at age 30. This is again younger than you would normally do this in somebody who did not have Down syndrome. And they recommend screening with either a hemoglobin A1C or a fasting plasma glucose every three years starting at age 30. Now, we know that obesity, and that's going to be one of the things that they talk about here in just a moment, but obesity is more common in people with Down syndrome. And so they recommend for any adults with Down syndrome and obesity that this screening should actually begin at age 21 and should be done every two or three years. So that's something to uh, remember for your adults that you take care of. Yeah. Cardiovascular disease, uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is actually less common in people with Down syndrome than it is in the typical population. We don't know why. There must be something on the 21st chromosome that is somehow protective against these cholesterol plaques that all of us start developing in early life. But in people with Down syndrome, we don't see those as frequently. And so what they recommended was that if somebody with Down syndrome is on a statin, uh, it should be reassessed every five years uh, at age 40 and above and using the 10-year risk calculator that you can get from the U.S. Pre Preventive Services Task Force. Um, so um, not thinking that once somebody is on a statin, they need to be on it forever, especially if they have Down syndrome, it should be reassessed as to whether or not it needs to be continued. Regarding stroke, uh, they had a couple of recommendations there looking at uh, risk factors for strokes and following the management as you would normally do with the AHA and American Stroke Association guidelines for prevention of stroke. Um, and then especially in people with Down syndrome who have had any type of history of congenital heart disease, this is the one thing that potentially increases their risk of stroke. Otherwise, we don't see stroke as often as you might see in another adult. But if they've had congenital heart disease, even corrected as a child, they do have an elevated risk of cardioembolic stroke. And so the recommendation was consideration of a pediatric uh, cardiac, I'm sorry, periodic cardiac evaluation and monitoring by a cardiologist if they do have a history of congenital heart disease. Okay, now we talked about obesity just earlier, and just like we would think about in the general population for people with Down syndrome, they do recommend uh, that we should be monitoring for obesity and weight change and calculating the BMI and in incorporating any type of obesity-related um, uh, management plans as you would for any other adult. There is no data really to support that that's going to make any long-term consequence for somebody with Down syndrome, but they're extrapolating from the general population that this would be something that should be done in obesity in people with Down syndrome as well. And lenoaxial instability, we touched on just a bit ago with the, in the pediatric population. Similarly, in adults with Down syndrome, we need to be thinking about that laxity of C1 on C2 and potential spinal cord compression that can come along with that. So therefore, screening with sign, for signs and symptoms of upper motor neuron deficits is important at every exam and then imaging based on what the exam might show. Osteoporosis, um, they do not um, uh, recommend uh, the... Um, 
things like DEXA scans and things like you would normally perhaps get in adults in general, um, or using any kind of fracture risk estimators that are out there. Um, really, what they 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 feel like the most most of the medications that that type of evaluation might lead to, um, such as those that might prevent bone resorption, are not going to be as helpful in adults with Down syndrome because the issue is the issue with uh, building of bone, not resorption of bone in Down syndrome. And so again, more detail is going to be needed, but they do say if there is a fragility related fracture, that you should do screening for secondary causes of osteoporosis like you would in anybody else um, with that screening. Thyroid uh, screening is recommended to be continued even into adulthood in people with Down syndrome. And so every one or two years, they should be getting a TSH checked. Um, so then they had statements of good practice that came out that pretty much summarize uh, the uh, things that we've talked about. So I'm not going to go through these each individually, but you can you can see here and you can also find, of course, in the article itself, uh, some of these statements of pra good practice. So I always, whenever I, uh, I'm about to conclude a talk, I always want to make sure that the audience, particularly medical audiences, are aware that there are benefits to the extra chromosome 21 that are not taught in medical school uh, very frequently. So we see a reduced incidence of solid organ tumors in people with Down syndrome. We don't know why. Um, we know that there must be something oncoprotective that is produ produced by the 21st chromosome uh, and therefore uh, must be protective against things like brain cancer, liver cancer, lung cancer, things like that. Uh, we just don't see that at any frequency in people with Down syndrome. Atherosclerotic disease, we touched on earlier, hypertension. So a lot of the internists in the audience are like, wait a minute, these are all the things that I'm always screening for. We don't see them at as high a frequency in people with Down syndrome. And hypertension is very uncommon. Um, stroke, we talked about that earlier, non, if, especially non-congenital heart disease related stroke is, is pretty uncommon. In pediatrics, especially, we talk a lot about the fact that we don't see as much asthma and allergy as you might expect. A lot of kids get diagnosed with allergy, but many times in people with Down syndrome, it's more of an anatomic upper airway narrowing than it's truly an allergy to the environment. And so it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. Again, not well understood at this point. We don't see dental cavities at anywhere near the rate that one might expect um, in the uh, typical population. We don't see them as often in people with Down syndrome. We see better outcomes in things like AML, acute myelogenous leukemia. We see better outcomes in a specific pediatric seizure, infantile spasms. Uh, we see better treatment outcomes in those as well. So a lot of medical things that, uh, again, not often thought about, but boy, there's got to be something there that if we could figure out what it is on that 21st chromosome that somehow is protective against these things, that our friends with Down syndrome could be ones who are also helping us as well with, uh, uh, with our lives as well. So typical uh, non-medical. Now, again, this is not an overgeneralization, but when you interact with people with Down syndrome, more than when you interact with people in the general population, most of the time we're going to experience people who are more loving, more forgiving, more organized, more honest. Again, not 100%, but something that is a unique feature that many people with Down syndrome have that I wish I had uh, more of those types of personality traits. Intellectually, we see some benefits as well to the 21st chromosome. People with Down syndrome are very good at visual memory, which helps them, including in things like reading. So when we're teaching young ones with Down syndrome to read, if we go with the typical phonics style, let's say the word is cat, and you tell them what a C sounds like and an A and a T, you can teach them phonics, but it's a little bit harder for them to learn than if you give them a picture of a cat and the word cat underneath it, and you work on sight words style learning how to read, actually reading can become a skill that surpasses even their peers uh, reading in early education. And so that's a really wonderful thing for educators to be aware of. Another thing that we talk about is situational memory. So particularly memories that are associated with um, emotion. So um, the birthday party uh, from 10 years ago, oh, I remember that birthday party. You remember that was the birthday party where we went to McDonald's and we had so much fun and it was great. And the memory of that moment, because it was such a happy memory, they can remember that so much clearer and all the details around it. Sometimes that can be difficult uh, and maladaptive in such, to some extent. Grandma dies, you know, 25 years ago, grandma dies, and yet it's still relived in the memory of somebody with Down syndrome as if it happened yesterday. So the it, it's, it's, again, an emotionally connected memory that they can remember such details even more than uh, perhaps us in the general population. 
So I want to leave you with some slides before we go to an open Q&A time. Um, uh, some information um, uh, on our center and our, our contact information. Helpful national websites are listed here as well. Uh, everything that we do at our local Down Syndrome Center is done through philanthropy. So whenever I give this talk, I always let people know that that is uh, something that we are so indebted to our community for having created our center back in 1989 and then sustaining it year after year for the last 33 years. And then we have a podcast that we do, do through the center, which is uh, openly available on any of your favorite podcast sites. And uh, you can take a listen to any topic in way more detail than we were able to go through today um, and uh, uh, be able to get uh, more information there. So this is me and my brother. This is why I do what I do. Uh, this is, you talk about situational memory. This is probably the highlight of my medical career to this point. I was president of the National Down Syndrome Congress and my brother uh, came, in the, we hosted it in Pittsburgh, my home city uh, currently. And uh, my brother came out and he shared the stage with me and gave the plenary address. And I get choked up even thinking about it now. It was just a beautiful moment uh, and one that I will never forget myself. So with that, uh, I will go ahead and uh, shut my slides off here and open up for, for any questions that may have come in or may come in as we uh, are, are talking. I'm gonna share a slide while we're having questions. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Safrabeen and Dr. Velody. We really appreciate it. Um, just coming from the chat, we have um, Dr. Baird said that Ohio does TSH and reflux okay. free T4. Perfect. Um, and then Dr. Roizen was asking, is type 2 diabetes more common in Down syndrome? It's such a great question, Nancy. Hi, nice to, nice to see you, not see you uh, again. Um, it's such a it's such an interesting question. There's so much data that shows that obesity should increase the risk of type 2 diabetes, and therefore we should be seeing a type 2 diabetes epidemic in adults with Down syndrome, and yet we don't. And so I think when I've spoken with the authors of the of the adult guideline, they included that in there. Again, one of those ones without much data specific to people with Down syndrome, uh, at least no high quality data. And that is something I think that would be so wonderful for a student or a resident or somebody um, uh, on this call to say, that would be a really interesting population study to see how common is it really? I don't think it would be that hard of a study to look at. And I don't think we're seeing it at anywhere near the rate that we would. Uh, if it was just a, a simple obesity leads to higher incidence of, of diabetes, uh, we would be seeing it a whole lot more in the adults with Down syndrome and we're just not. Thank you. And Dr. Gilmore um, asked in the chat as well, can you discuss regression in younger Down syndrome patients? Yes, my goodness. What an interesting phenomenon. And it's like, it dominates our uh, Down Center Medical Interest Group discussions these days. Whenever we get we gather together, we even have a entire I think hour or two hours where everyone gets together and starts to talk about management approaches because this is one of those phenomena that are, are incredibly challenging for the person with Down syndrome as well as for their family. It, typically, the um, what we see is that this is in uh, typically in somebody who has been very. Uh, developing extremely well, you know, they had they've been doing well, inclusive environments they are getting ready to for their next stage in life, whether it's going to be college or, or getting a job, and, and they're doing really, really well. And then all of a sudden, you see this withdrawn affect, like, where, where did this come from? And then gradually that progresses. And sometimes it can even progress to things like catatonia, mutism, they just stop speaking, and they, and they, all, they withdraw into themselves to such an extent. And, and it used to be, and they don't get pleasure in the things that they used to get pleasure in, and, and uh, they refuse to eat those foods that they once loved. And it's, it's, it's jarring to the family to experience this. And I know that probably 20 years ago, people would have said, oh, well, that's Down syndrome. And then we see Alzheimer and Down syndrome. So this is just early onset dementia, which is what it would have been called back then. But now we've discovered that really what it is, and we, we're also working out what's the the name that everybody wants to go with, but Down syndrome regression, uh, regression in Down syndrome, regression disorder, those types of things are what's been thrown around. And what we've discovered is that it's treatable, that if it's recognized and then sent to a, a center or a place that is used to dealing with this condition, things like um, um, uh, benzodiazepines or SSRIs or um, even things like ECT, IVIG, JAK inhibition, all of these methods are all being tried depending on the center where you're at. 
will be how your center approaches it, which is not the way to do medicine, right? I mean, this should make us all kind of cringe, like, oh, we got to get something unified. So there is a large multi-center consortium that is working on that exact question. What is it that works? What should be our approach, uh, both to workup and treatment? And how can we get these kids back, young and young adults, back on track uh, to where they were before. And, and it's exciting because it's treatable, um, but it's it's scary in that when you get that call, in fact, even now, uh, right after this, I'm probably going to be checking our, our our EMR again because we have a family who's dealing with this right now. And then what do we do? What do we do? And um, and so it, it's 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 very nerve wracking, but it's very treatable. And so I hope that gives you a little bit of a, uh, of a background. And, and we've done a few papers on that that you can find online as well. And I... I just want to add, as the medical outreach director of Dasanio, I don't provide medical advice, but because of my time on the National Down Syndrome Congress, I was on the board for nine years, and then my husband was on the board for nine years, including time with Dr. Velody. I, I know people across the nation and through DISMIG USA. I probably don't know the answer, but I can try to find a resource for you. Because so, feel free to email me. Once. When somebody has Down syndrome, they tend to be able to get any rare thing more than your typical person. So I can be a resource to find you an expert or find you some, a family. If so, a family wants to talk to somebody who's had a similar experience, there's Facebook groups, there's a lot of support and I wanna be that conduit to help providers who might see one or two patients with Down syndrome and. So we don't get the 25 year olds being diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's when it's really regression or somebody didn't think about Moya Moya disease with a person with a stroke or any other other thing, we can do that for you. Okay, and I think Dr. Stehauer has his hand up for a question. Yeah, I was curious. I, um, one thing I didn't see a lot in the adult guidelines was anything to do with um, pulmonary disease or risk factors. And um, you, you know, you, you touched on some of the assessments that recommended to kids. And I know uh, one of our peds pulmonologists, Dan Craven, I still remember him teaching me a lot about this in residency, about the multiple things that can combine um, in kids with Down syndrome. And this certainly I have in mind from an adult we cared for very recently. Um, <clears throat> any thoughts about some of like whether adults, young adults, even, you know, maybe teenagers should be reassessed for things like sleep apnea, silent aspiration. Should we be reevaluating at some point for the development of pulmonary hypertension? Is that something you hear discussed? Yeah, that's, that's real, those are great questions. And of course, they're not questions that the guideline is currently addressing. But in terms of sleep apnea, we know that um, it's, even in pediatrics, I can get a sleep study at age five. It can say everything was great or it could, be, it could have had sleep apnea that got addressed and a repeat study says everything's great. But then they're 15 and all of a sudden anatomy is changing. They're growing. Everything inside them is growing. And then they start to have signs of sleep apnea again. It's not time to say, oh, well, you've already had a study done. It's actually time to repeat that study. And the same thing happens in the adult side, too. And you correctly assess that untreated sleep apnea does increase the risk of pulmonary hypertension, which people with Down syndrome are already at higher risk of developing um, for reasons we don't fully know. They're born oftentimes with persistent pulmonary hypertension that doesn't go away. It has nothing to do with sleep apnea, obviously, when they're first born. So yes, I would definitely recommend reassessing for sleep apnea anytime in an adult if there is signs of sleep apnea at that time. Right. The the big concern we also have in people with uh, Down syndrome, especially into adulthood, is is a worsening or perhaps uh, onset of aspiration pneumonia. In fact, when you look at most common causes of deaths in adults, oftentimes Alzheimer's listed, but of course Alzheimer doesn't cause death. What usually is the cause of death is aspiration or pneumonia um, uh, relating to aspiration. So yes, that's something I would definitely be paying close attention to too, especially as your adult with Down syndrome is aging, if they start to have feeding dis, dis, uh, uh, discomfort or um, dysphagia or something like that, I would definitely move for a sleep, uh, for a swallow study at that point too. Excellent, thank you. And we have um, quite a few questions in the chat, so I'll kind wonderful. of start going through. Yeah. Um, so Kendall Franz, one of our wonderful med peds, third year residents, um, said you spoke about hearing, curious about otitis media and Down syndrome. Yes, otitis media is extremely common in people with Down syndrome and is part of the reason why we, we 
do hearing screens so frequently uh, in the early stages, in the early years of life, because um, they may not be able to vocalize necessarily that the ear hurts or something like that. Uh, the eustachian tube is comes off at a more of a, uh, uh, I don't know what the word is from a surgical, but like oblique angle. It's not, it's not as, it's not as uh, vertical. It, it's more horizontal in, in orientation. And so the drainage of the middle ear contents is not as effective in people with Down syndrome and retained fluid in the middle ear is what causes a higher incidence of otitis media. And uh, the other aspect of this is that we know that in people with Down syndrome, and this is uh, uh, going to be coming out in, a, in an upcoming study as well that we were a part of, the um, their ability to mount a response to um, cap encapsulated organisms, particularly pneumococcus, is impaired. You can have somebody who got the entire childhood vaccination series, including the Prevnar, um, that is intended to you know, boost their uh, immune response against pneumococcal uh, uh, infections, and yet it doesn't uh, make their antibody response as effective as you would expect. So for children with Down syndrome, who have um, uh, any kind of recurrent respiratory or cardiac issues, the recommendation is that they get Pneumovac starting at age five. And so um, that is something that we uh, definitely would recommend for somebody who's having a recurrent pneumococcal infection, including um, uh, recurrent otitis media or something like that as they get older, uh, consideration of Pneumovac even at an earlier age would be something that you would want to consider. And Dr. Sipperbreen, please, if I'm saying something that you would want to add to, please do, because obviously yes, you're I, I, yeah. When I was in practice, I usually gave all my patients with Down syndrome pneumovac starting mm -hmm. at age two and then boosted it again in five years it, because so many of the patients did have recurrent pneumonia. And, um, and there's also some thinking that vitamin D levels mm -hmm. are typically lower in people with Down syndrome and also putting them at risk for um, more respiratory infections. So that's something that um, one can look into also. And as I, I said in the chat, higher risk for serious RSV mm -hmm. um, infections and influenza um, and not a great response to the influenza vaccine. Correct, Kish? Kish no, Dr. I don't Bowie? know that that's specifically been studied in Down syndrome, but um, but definitely the the pneumonia, uh, the strep pneumonia. Um, and thank you, Dr. Ziprobin. You're correct. It's uh, it's starting at age two that you can use the pneumovax vaccine for that population if uh, if if you feel it's warranted. Yes. Excellent. Okay, and then we had two questions about transitions of care. So from Dr. Shapiro and Dr. Wilhelm. Mm -hmm. um, so Dr. Shapiro asked, how would you describe your current transition process? Is there a certain age that you would transition and do you find it difficult to find adult providers to hand off to? Oh my goodness, yes. What a great question. And I can't believe I spoke to a MedPeds audience and didn't use the word transition. What kind of presentation was that? It, it's so important. Transition for people in general, but let alone that, people with disabilities, um, you know, the, the, the life expectancy for somebody with Down syndrome, uh, probably in 1950, was somewhere in the age of 14, 15 years old. The life expectancy now is into the 60s. So this, uh, this concept of adult care with Down syndrome, uh, for somebody with Down syndrome, is relatively new. Right, and so um, it's it's something that we need to definitely uh, be be more uh, aware of. In our center, we have a transition clinic that's run by Andy McCormick, who's MedPeds uh, trained. And uh, what I do is at age fourteen, we begin to transition our uh, teenaged patients to him. And then he takes them from fourteen till however long it takes to be able to transition them to adult care. We're, we are blessed to have an adult Down syndrome center in Pittsburgh, so we can provide a lifespan of care. We know that that's not something that's found everywhere, um, but it's definitely something we are glad to have. But as part of the transition visit, like it would be probably for any of you who do transition uh, type visits for anyone with any kind of medical complexity, we focus not only on the medical aspects of transition, who's the right endocrinologist to forward you over to after you're an adult or cardiologist or any of those types of things, but he also talks about for that particular um, patient, what are their goals and what are the parents goals and how do we get there? And so are the goals college is the goal uh, uh, living on their own is the goal getting a job or staying at home living with a sibling, all of these things are talked about during those transition visits talking about power of attorney and guardianship and what's the difference and what's best for your particular situation, uh, setting up a special needs trust, you know, Un Uncle Sam is glad to take all the money uh, uh, from you or prevent you from getting your 
uh, your um, benefits um, if you put all the money in the child uh, who is now become an adult's name. And so lots of things that they talk about in that transition visit. And I'm sure that Dr. McCormick would love to, to come and share his model for you guys, if that would be something that you'd be interested in potentially learning more about. It's as Christopher's 30, it's it's so important to address the transition. I was very lucky because I'm a pediatrician. I had a very good internist, Dr. Detour, who was my internist, and he was willing to accept Christopher during um, Christopher's neurosurgeries. Dr. Crystal Tomei was invaluable in helping. And I know we discussed this and she, um, Dr. Tomei, I think you're on here, if you would want to speak to transition, because I know that a lot of your patients have um, congenital syndromes and that you said the neurosurgery program is working on that also. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, I, I think, you know, as somebody who, who treats these patients, one of the things that we have the hardest time doing is finding um, and smoothing the transition over. And this is our patients with hydrocephalus, our patients with spina bifida, any of the patients with kind of chronic mm -hmm. congenital diseases. Mm -hmm. we, we have such a hard time because the, the congenital aspect of um, what we're treating is instilled in kind of what we do in peds. The nice thing with neurosurgery is that like I'm adult neurosurgery trained and then I you know, took an ex some extra time doing peds. And it's just a matter of the logistics of the hospital system that they're in. Uh, there's a lot of pediatric neurosurgeons across the country that that don't transition these patients because they're in a setup where they can continue to, to follow them as adults. And that was actually my intent here until I realized that I can't get OR time on the adult side. So <laughs> it's not actually fair to my patients for me to hang on to them, but then not actually be able to give them the treatments that they need in a timely fashion. Um, so I've been very fortunate here, and one of our adult partners has actually been very um, willing to kind of accept these patients, and really everything that we're doing is trying to optimize the warm handoff. Um, it, you can't underestimate the relationship that's been built over the 22 years of childhood that, that I can look at several of my patients and know if they're doing well or not doing well because I've known them for so long and and being able to try and convey that um, onto an a, adult care provider um, takes some nuance so I think one of the things that's really important is when you do set up these transition programs making these as warm of a handoff as possible but also preparing families and patients for that Right, that very drastic change when you migrate from a peds system into an adult system. Um, there's a lot less handholding. There's not always the same accommodations. Like when I've had adult patients that are admitted over on the hospital side, standardly, they don't let parents stay in the ICU. They don't let anybody stay in the ICU with them. And I've had to advocate for them um, to say, you know, like my this nonverbal patient whose parents can identify if he's in pain or not is not going to receive the same level of treatment if we don't adapt this policy. Um, so, and I think a lot of those types of policy changes and, and those types of um, exceptions are much easier pushed from their pediatric provider than from their adult provider. So I think there's a, there's a lot of nuances in transition. I think if we can do it right and we can understand what the barriers are on the adult side and have the right partners on the adult side, um, then we can make it a smooth process. And a lot of it is expectation setting with families and patients, but then also making sure that we don't stop advocating for them once they've reached adulthood. Thank you so much. Didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but I, I I can't overstate how helpful Dr. Tomei was when Christopher was sick and the and the nurses because the nurses are those that are there um you know I was even during the surge I was allowed to stay but I could not stay awake 24 hours a day for 5 days and it was a real risk that Chris was going to pull out the drain from the subdural space so they they the nurses wrote whatever they needed to in the chart to let a parent stay. And that is so important for a parent with a disability. During the COVID time when there was limited hospital um, visitation, 
I, I can't tell you the panic among parents of children with disabilities that the thoughts that their child might be in the hospital without them. I mean, you see that Christopher speaks very well, but he speaks very well, but he he can't always explain what he's thinking. And I literally, like we literally, somebody was one foot away from him for five days so we could grab his hand if he started reaching for that drain. So the hospital policy is accommodating parents of adult children with disabilities are so important. Absolutely, thank you all for commenting on that. Um, I just wanted to say that we're kind of up to a little past 1 p.m. So um, Dr. Sifer Bean and Dr. Velody have um, agreed for an extended Q&A. So if anyone wants to stay on, we can continue with questions. Um, Dr. Wilhelm is a pediatric cardiologist and kind of along that transition question she had asked um, specifically within cardiology and adult congenital heart disease specialists, should they start transitioning at the same time um, as patients without Down syndrome? I think it's it's wonderful that if you're if you have ad adult congenital heart disease, people who are interested in that, I think it's a wonderful thing to be able to do that transition. I, I think where families really struggle is that if they're in a place where there aren't uh, people, there are adult cardiologists, of course, but they're not necessarily familiar with Down syndrome or congenital heart disease um, uh, or the combination of the two, that's really, really struggle, a real struggle. So I know that most likely where you are as well as where we are in Pittsburgh, a lot of the times uh, the congenital heart disease uh, patients with congenital heart disease who have now graduated to adulthood, if they don't have somewhere to go locally for an adult cardiologist that's familiar with that, they'll, they'll stay with the pediatric cardiologist longer, which of course is not ideal. Um, you would hope that there would be more and more uh, folks, uh, but thankfully as MedPeds grows, I think more and more of the adult congenital heart disease things will grow as well, which is wonderful. Excellent. Okay. And then Dr. Sitagam had asked, is the differential diagnosis of fevers any different in Down syndrome? Any opportunistic infections more common or any pathogens more likely than others? Um, I mean, in terms of opportunistic type infections, uh, we certainly see, like we were talking about earlier, pneumococcal disease more frequently in people with Down syndrome, and that can be as uh, uh, non-threatening as otitis media or sinusitis, and pneumonia, things like that. It can be bacteremia more likely with the same organism as well. Of course, that would be much more serious. We also see a lot higher um, uh, skin and soft tissue staph aureus infections, so things like folliculitis and um, hydradenitis superativa and things of that nature are more common in people with Down syndrome. And again, nobody really knows why it is that the staph uh, aureus seems to be uh, more common in those types, why, why it seems to more commonly infect people with Down syndrome than you would expect. And we also see a lot more fungal type infections of the skin. So um, uh, every visit, uh, especially in the summertime, if I look at the in between the toes of every patient, which I do, I will at least once or twice a week uncover uh, athlete's foot that they had no idea, you know, tinea pedis, they had no idea it was there. Um, and uh, because nobody looks and the kids always seem to want to wear socks and shoes in the summertime. And so it's like perfect breeding ground for fungal infections. And so we definitely see more of those as well. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm not thinking of any other things that I would think differently, the, the things that we have seen um, as infections that go undiagnosed, we, we know that pain sensation tends to be, uh, or at least um, uh, vocally, vocally telling somebody about the pain that they're feeling tends to be less frequent in people with Down syndrome. And so we have seen kids who have had uh, prolonged fever, and then you ultrasound their belly, and they had must have had a ruptured appendicitis, you know, a few weeks ago, but they didn't they didn't tell someone or they didn't necessarily um, uh, feel that sensation in the same way that we do. And so it goes undiagnosed and then they have these prolonged fevers. So anytime I see prolonged fever in somebody with Down syndrome, I often think about where could this infection be hiding that you would say, oh, that should be super painful. They may not be able to express that pain in the same way. Well, and thank you. And Dr. Armitage, one of our ID attendings asked if there's a higher risk for endocarditis. Um, not that I've read not, and not that I've seen. Um, of course, if somebody has a, a valvular dysfunction or a surgically repaired heart valve or something like that, I'm sure it would be higher, but it just Down syndrome alone, I don't think that I've seen anything like that. 
Thanks. And Alberta Costa um, asked, could you discuss some of the sensory issues that affect adults with Down syndrome, including early cataracts, um, keratoconus, and neurosensory hearing loss, et cetera? Yeah. Alberto, nice to, nice to talk to you and, of course, quote-unquote, see you here as well. Um, yeah, we definitely see cataract formation, even in the in immediate newborn period. Uh, we can see uh, congenital cataracts as well. But, yes, def developing even into their teenage years and young adult uh, and adult years, we can see cataracts quite frequently. So it's very important to do an, a, um, a, retina, a retinal exam with, with every patient that you see at every visit um, when they have Down syndrome. Uh, and frequent referral then to the ophthalmologist for management of that would be important. Sometimes they just stay snowflake size and they don't bother vision. If they start to impair the visual axis, then they have to be removed, obviously. Keratoconus is definitely something that we see more uh, frequently in Down syndrome, suspicions being that frequent rubbing of the eyes can cause the uh, the corneal shape uh, to change over time. Um, and so there are multiple centers across the country that are a part, I think it's still I think it's still a study uh, in, in the study phase of looking at uh, corneal cross-linking in Down syndrome and finding it to be very effective in the management of keratoconus. And so I did a podcast with our uh, ophthalmologist. Uh, you can look that up on the web uh, uh, or on your podcast app, and you can find more information about the approach to that. And then hearing loss, yes. Uh, if, if you look at the studies, you, you'll find anywhere from 15 to 50% of people with Down syndrome will have a hearing, an abnormal hearing screen at some point in their life. Sometimes it's very simple, conductive hearing loss that just needs ear tubes or something like that to help that um, uh, uh, pressure to equalize within the middle ear and, and, and external ear space. Uh, but sometimes it can be sensory neural hearing loss, which of course would then uh, require uh, some sort of uh, augmentation for their hearing and uh, audiology following very closely for that as well. So it's a very important thing to keep in mind. And often, 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 this is one of those areas of the um, guidelines that are not followed, uh, which, uh, because, oh, they're hearing fine, they're doing great. They always hear when we, you know, are talking in the other room about them or something like that. And as we all know, as physicians, the hearing loss can often start outside of the speech range. And so catching it early before it starts to affect speech is the goal. And so that's where that frequent audiology visits are very important. Global Down syndrome did a great webinar on keratoconus with an ophthalmologist and really explained the cross-linking where they use a solution that actually dissolves some of the cornea and then they use another special solution to have the tissue grow back. So um, if anybody wants more information, the global website has recordings of their past webinars and it was fascinating. Okay, and then um, a VA provider, I can't tell based on the, the shortened screen name, but um, asked is folate supplementation a current recommendation for Down syndrome infants? Hmm. I've not, I've not seen that. I, I could see the theory as to why someone might think it would be uh, helpful, which, which would be because they uh, very often have a very high MCV, so they're macrocytic quite frequently. The CBC findings in people with Down syndrome can, can throw um, providers for a loop if they're not familiar with seeing some of the more common CBC findings, one of them being macrocytosis. We do not suspect that that is folate uh, or B12 related, and so supplementation with that has not been part of the uh, any healthcare guideline for uh, people with Down syndrome. But other things just to be aware of as we're talking about the CBC, we see a lot of leukopenia. So the kids uh, tend to have lower white blood cell count, so they'll flag as low, but it's not uh, of any concern, especially if it's an isolated finding on that CBC. We see neutropenia more frequently, especially in the kids with Down syndrome. I'm not sure with adults, but certainly with kids, uh, we see a lot of neutropenia. Um, like we talked about the macrocytosis uh, is also very common as well. So that's that's a challenge too, because if we have somebody with iron deficiency and we're waiting for them to become microcytic, uh, they may be iron deficient for a long time and having the developmental um, um, you know, outcomes of having iron deficiency without even knowing because we're waiting for microcytosis, which may never show because they'll just flag in the normal range because they started macrocytic. So important to really think about those iron studies when you're doing those annual um, screenings for iron with uh, children with Down syndrome. And along the hematological course, um, petechiae are very common in people with Down syndrome. Like if the seatbelt hits them wrong, if, you know, 
Chris used to get them on his earlobe, but I still would all, if somebody comes in with significant petechiae, even if you want to do the CBC, I've had kids who had ITP, I had kids with leukemia. Um, so there is somewhat of a functional platelet dysfunction that goes along with it, but also you don't want to miss the kid with ITP or leukemia. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think that are, is all the questions in the chat. Does anyone else have any questions on the call? Okay, well, thank you so much for all of the teaching. This was such a fantastic presentation. Um, we really appreciate you joining us and teaching us. Oh, thank you for having me. This was great, yeah. Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye all. Bye. Thank you.